Hey everybody, Eric Grenier here and welcome to the 92nd episode of the RIT Podcast. We're into week one of the Alberta election campaign, so how is the campaign kicking off? Joining me to discuss it this week is uh, the CBC's political provincial affairs reporter in Calgary, Elise Von Schiel, and Lisa Young, political science professor at the University of Calgary. Hello to both of you. Thanks for joining me. Hi. Hello. Uh, maybe Elise, well, I'll, I'll kick it off to you because, you know, you've been covering the ups and downs. What are the big takeaways from week one? That nobody seems to be in any rush to do anything or go anywhere. Uh, even some of the messaging that we've seen from the different campaigns feels like a week three thing, not a week one thing. Rachel Notley was out on Thursday, the NDP leader, uh, making an appeal to conservative voters, basically saying, if you don't like where you were before, give us a chance. You don't have to vote for us every election, but maybe give us a chance, which seems like a lead up to the poll kind of uh, kind of pitch. And the UCP leader, Danielle Smith, is only coming out every couple of days. So we're not seeing daily media availabilities from her, which is a bit of a strange thing. Um, the NDP hasn't really hit their stride yet in terms of filling that, that airspace that is left by the UCP not being out with their leader every day. It's been a weird, slow campaign in the sense of like you're getting ready for a rocket to launch and then there's like some fuel issue and it just putters out before it leaves the <laughs> leaves the stand. So I, I don't know about Lisa's take, but this is a weird one for me and I've covered quite a few campaigns. It's different. Yeah, Lisa, what do you think about how this first week have been going so far? Yeah, I think, you know, and part of it, too, is on the weekend, it did sort of feel like, you know, a campaign was launching. Um, and the NDP especially, you know, sort of came rushing out of the gate and they had their sign crews all over Calgary and, you know, orange signs were going up and there was that sort of sense of building excitement. And then, like Elise said, you know, not much has happened. Um, you know, the uh, UCP has, has made one sort of major policy announcement about cutting taxes. The NDP has told us again about health care um, and, you know, in a little more detail than before. But there isn't sort of a shape to the, the conversation in some ways. And I think part of this is that we've been in this campaign unofficially for weeks or even months. And everyone, even the two parties, is, is a little bit out of fuel. Um, and so everyone's trying to muster up the energy to really have an election campaign. Okay, well, that sounds exciting for a first week. Um, why don't we zero in on uh, each of the parties? So starting with uh, Daniel Smith and the UCP, um, at least you already mentioned it. Uh, it's a very low key kind of takeoff. You know, there's a, been a comparison to maybe how Doug Ford has done things in Ontario in the last two campaigns. Very low key, not very present. But there was a difference in that campaign in that he was way ahead. And the opposition wasn't really all that organized. This is a, it seems like a, a, a strange tactic for a really, really close race. It's a strange tactic unless your leader has a track record of getting you in trouble most of the time she opens her mouth. And that was what the UCP was dealing with with Danielle Smith for a few months. She's been much more controlled in her messaging in the last little bit. But for the UCP, who doesn't exactly need to go out and campaign quite as hard. The seat math is a little bit better for them uh, when it comes down to actual math. And uh, so if you're the UCP, boring is probably good in this campaign. You want to communicate in a way that sticks to your main messages, which they've been focusing on the economy, uh, on tax cuts, uh, and a little bit on, on health care, which we saw in the lead up to this. But really, they're going out on their strong issues. And other than that, they're being pretty quiet. And I think that's intentional. I think uh, it's intentional to put control on the leader. And I think it's intentional to run a boring, slow campaign in a way that doesn't allow the opposition NDP to get any kind of real momentum. Lisa, what is your take on this? Because if things stay the same, then that might not be a bad kind of play, right, to try to keep everybody uh, in their spaces and just voting. But if we, by the end of the campaign, UCB is in a little bit of trouble. They're going to have to find another gear. They will. And I've wondered about this. I mean, I can certainly see the, you know, the, the logic behind what the UCP is doing. Whenever Danielle Smith gets out in front of a microphone and engages, she says things that they end up having to walk back. So you can certainly see the logic. But 
I wonder if there are risks to this strategy. And, you know, one of the things in Alberta is that there's an expectation from the electorate that there will be kind of a direct and unmediated relationship between voters and the premier. Um, and, you know, if we go back to the old days of Ralph Klein, right, there was sort of the sense that everyone was on first name basis with the premier and, you know, the party was kind of peripheral, the legislature was peripheral, what mattered was that relationship between the premier and the people. And I wonder how this approach of hiding the leader is going to play in the context of Alberta. Now, you know, granted, Alberta has changed, it's a different sort of election, but it also means that those people who are on the fence about Danielle Smith don't have any chance to be won over or not much of a chance to be won over by her. And she can be an effective communicator. So I wonder if they're going to have to loosen things up. To Lisa's point, though, I wonder if there is even a chance to get to know either of the leaders because we're in a rare situation where both of them are so well established. They've both been premier. They've both been uh, in the public eye for a really, really long time. And even in the, the advertising that you're seeing, in the first week of the campaign, it's typical to see biographical ads. This is who I am. This is why I'm running. This is what I want to do for Alberta. And we have seen zip from either of them. And I think that's a calculation on the part of the, the parties that people's opinions on these leaders are already pretty baked in, positive that, and negative. That that might be one of the reasons why it's a, it's a low-key start to the campaign, because there's not much to do. It's almost like uh, both campaigns just need to avoid a mistake and hope to get to the end of the election where the polls are more or less the same, and then it becomes just a ground game contest, rather than you know the difference between persuasion and just getting people out. Uh, so... That could be it. But if the UCP is adopting this strategy of not being all that present, uh, Lisa, is the NDP adapting to that? Are they, you, are they campaigning as if it is a normal campaign? Or are they adapting to the fact that the, U, the UCP seems to be wanting to keep things low, key and people disengaged? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I want to just echo what Elise said uh, a couple of minutes ago, where she said that the NDP hasn't adapted to, to fill this space. And, you know, part of the challenge for them, I think, is that they can have some policy, certainly, um, you know, and they've got a fairly well-established set of policies that they want to talk about, but there's a danger in coming out with something every day that's going to cost money because one of their negatives is they're going to spend too much money and then we're going to have a giant deficit. And so they, they need to say something without making it sound like there's going to be enormous amounts of public money coming out if they're elected. So it's a real balancing act on that front um, and and I don't think that they figured out what to do with that I think they're relying pretty heavily on a negative campaign against Danielle Smith and some of it they're running some of it is being run by by surrogates you know you see QP out advertising and and so on um, and that fills some of the space but it doesn't create that positive sense that they might need at least uh, for the NDP in their first week so far, is there any sign that it's any different from what we saw, say, in April, in March? Is there a new style? Is there a new approach? Is there a strategy that we're seeing develop from the NDP after these first few days? I think they're sticking pretty closely to what they've been working on for the first the last six months or so, first five months of the year, which I would say is probably pretty true for the UCP as well. But on day two of the campaign, Rachel Notley came out and talked about a, a promise to get uh, doctors, family doctors for Albertans who don't have them and a couple other details. Well, she announced that initially back in February. So she came out with like a couple more details, but essentially a re-announce of something from February. And some of the other policies that we've seen them come out with, they have hinted at before, and there's a lot of repetition about, uh, we talk about their, their weak areas on the economy, there's a lot of repetition of a report that they commissioned from a, a very, very well-known Alberta economist who they called in to, to give them recommendations for what they should do if they form government. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of play on the same issues, but where you might in a campaign expect some kind of evolution, I don't think that we've seen the parties really uh, hit their stride on the evolution of those ideas just yet. I guess the question is whether they're saving anything for later or, is, or if they don't have anything 
Well, we don't. We don't even have. Out. We don't even have uh, platforms yet. Like we mm-hmm. haven't seen the documents that lay out the the promises that lay out some of the costing. We haven't seen anything fulsome. It's been this weird trickle and then reannounce. And it's it's honestly it's like there's they're pouring a, a bucket of water down a spout, catching it at the other end and pouring it back in at the top, like one of those machines at like a kid's science center. So I, I and and we were all sitting here waiting for something big and we thought that even that was going to be maybe how they'd launch the campaign and Danielle Smith the UCP leader did come out with uh, with a concrete policy announcement on taxes that first day whereas Rachel Notley held more of a campaign kind of stump style uh, of of launch um, but it's been it's just been weird like that's that's kind of my takeaway it's like ready set go oh they're still in the starting blocks day five and they're still in the start okay okay <laughs> And, and I think one of the other oddities is that because there's so much focus on Calgary, there isn't even motion, right? Like there isn't sort of the sense that, you know, today the leader's going to be in Lesser Slave Lake, you know, and, and tomorrow they're going to be in Lethbridge. It's just kind of, well, they're going to be in someone's driveway in Calgary again, you know? Yeah, and I always wonder with these kinds of campaigns, does it really matter that you were in you know, southeast Calgary versus southwest Calgary. Are you really getting that much more of a boost because you're visiting this one riding that's two streets over from the other one? They're all the same. These all these suburban ridings. Um, how about was there a winner then? It, I, does anybody want to give a shot at that? At least was there a winner of week one? Oh, I mean, I think winning in this campaign is not shooting yourself in the foot, uh, and I think that there's enough weeks still to come that that's possible. Um, from week one of the campaign, I think they both stayed on their sword issues, the things that they're seen as strong on, and there wasn't a lot of action so much on the things that they need to defend against. Um, I don't know if I would, I would say both of them managed not to do anything disastrous, but I don't see, and I don't hear from the people that I talk to that either party did anything that would move the polls very much, which is what we've been waiting to see. How many more polls are we going to get that are a statistical tie or within, like, barely outside the margin of error? And it's been that way for months and months and months, despite big announcements and shifts and scandals and whatever else. It just doesn't seem to move much. Lisa, is it a draw then, We after week one still? I think to a considerable extent it, it is. Um, I think the UCP, you know, opening with the promise of a cut to income taxes was actually a a clever move. And I mean, terrible public policy. Um, Alberta has the lowest personal income taxes, you know, there's no desperate need for this. But it gave them something that delivers, you know, they can link it to the affordability question, which we know matters. And it's it's sort of an answer. And, you know, one of the things, you know, images just kind of stick with you sometimes in elections. And all over Calgary, uh, the NDP has put up these um, billboards that say, what will she do next with kind of um, Danielle Smith's face floating in, in the dark um, and a weather vane. And somebody from the UCP took this on, on social media and added a little um, sticker saying, cut taxes. And now every time I go past one of these, I, I see the cut taxes, right? And, and that's a message that's maybe simple and direct enough to connect with those undecided voters, the you know, the, the people who've only just started paying attention this week. So if, if I was going to give a win to one side or another for this week, maybe the UCP for that. That kind of stuff is a really good pitch in Calgary, too, because we talk about Calgary being the home of these reluctant UCP voters, as I think David Coletto at Abacus calls them, uh, or, or the mushy middle voters, the undecideds, the people who probably voted progressive conservative before the conservative parties merged, who probably don't like the NDP very much, but they are, they look at Danielle Smith and don't identify with her politics either. And it's it's this, you know, this kind of famous way of talking about Alberta conservatives, which is that they're not really fiscally conservative. They're just tax averse. They just don't like the government taking their money. Uh, and so for a pitch on taxes, something that will cut income taxes, or they're, they're really trying to wedge the NDP on corporate tax too, um, 
you, you can see this subtle play to the people that both parties have identified uh, as needing to secure in order to form government. What about the arena deal that was announced just before the election was uh, called? A uh, huge amount of public money, both from the uh, municipal government and the provincial government, going to build uh, this arena for the Calgary Flames. It'll have some other things as well. But uh, there was a poll that was from Think HQ. It had among Calgarians it was 50% approval, 45% disapproval for the deal, which to me sounds like a wash because that's more or less what the polls are showing in terms of UCP and DP support. So it doesn't seem to have be helping anything. Um, Elise, has has this stayed an issue or is it already kind of going away as an issue? Because the NDP doesn't seem to be overly against it, just kind of not too keen on, on the details. Anytime I have an opportunity to blame hockey for something, I will. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that we saw it be a big issue for a couple of days. I think as the campaign really kicked off, it hasn't been so big of an issue. And at CBC Calgary, we're doing this thing called Vote Compass, where we ask the parties for um, their stances on certain issues. Uh, people can go through and kind of figure out where they fit on the spectrum. And we ask a couple of additional questions, new ones each week. And one of the questions that we had uh, these respondents answer, and we had thousands and thousands of them, was their uh, their approach or what they thought about the arena deal. And it's like equally not popular based on uh, our numbers were pretty similar to the the polling that you had pointed out um and especially outside of calgary like if people aren't going to get to go to this new arena i I think people can think of a place that 300 million dollars could go in their community for a hospital or for whatever else but i just don't think it it's gonna stick um as an issue that again moves people around just based on what we've been hearing from people even though people love their hockey team here uh Calgary during playoffs is nuts, but it, it just it just may not be a thing that ends up um, in the win column. It's maybe not a loss either if it ends up washing out at around 50% in public opinion one way or another, but it's uh, no signs are going up for uh, UCP staffers to put, we'll build an arena on the attack ads. <laughs> Lisa, anything to add on the arena? You know, the only thing I would say, I, I've been skeptical that it would make any difference in, in the election, you know, on, on the theory that the people who are excited about the arena were already voting UCP. But there was something in the Ipsos poll that uh, was released a couple of days ago that it, I've just been thinking about. And they found a 17 point gender gap in support for uh, the UCP with men um, you know, 17 points more likely than women. Um, and, you know, and, and the NDP is is struggling to get uh, male voters. And we've seen gender gaps pretty consistently in, in all of these polls, but I don't think we've seen one that's that large. And we know that the Ipsos poll is, is good, right, methodologically. So I wondered if, if, you know, the arena deal had done something, but that's purely speculation there. But it certainly does speak to you know, a challenge for the NDP in in making inroads into uh, male voters, which they're going to have to do if they're going to get over the line. Uh, how about after the first couple of days, uh, Elise, start with you. Are you seeing any signs of a party, either the UCP or the NDP, that is has a good organization in place, is ready for this campaign, or the opposite? Though it, it looks like they're getting some trouble getting the machine rolling as the first days uh, unfold. They've both brought in some pretty senior support, people who either worked for the previous Notley government or who had other uh, kind of prominent roles. And so I think um, the the fact that they can get people like that involved indicates to me, as somebody who talks to a lot of political strategists, that they're both stra- strategist sides see some things to be gained from trying to eke out a win here. Um, And that if either the NDP or the UCP win, it will be considered a a successful campaign for whoever wins because it will be very, very hard fought. Um, There's a lot of excitement on the ground. Uh, I think there there were a couple of weeks where the doors, especially in Calgary, were not very UCP friendly from what I was hearing from people who were out canvassing. Uh, that has shifted a little bit and that I, I hear from the people that I've talked to that there's a little bit more willingness to at least engage with whoever's coming to the doors, even if they continue to be a little bit skeptical of of Danielle Smith. So I think even though the 
maybe public facing side has been a little quiet in this first week. I think there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes and a lot of excitement. Like I, I don't get the sense that either campaign is kind of dragging their feet into this. But I think some of that momentum hasn't exactly translated into what the general public is seeing from the campaign. Yeah, Brian Topp is running the NDP's campaign. He, of course, is a, a huge, a hugely experienced NDP operative. He's worked in Saskatchewan. He's worked. He ran for the federal leadership back in 2012. He's been around, uh, so he knows how to win campaigns. And then the Steve Outhouse, who's running the UCP campaign, uh, he was uh, instrumental in Leslin Lewis's two uh, pretty good, uh, you know, compared to expectations campaigns for the conservative leadership. So they do have some uh, seasoned people at the top of these campaigns, not not rookies by any stretch. Uh, Lisa. What are, what are your views on, on how the machines are looking after the first few days? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I have a slightly different view on this than, than Elise. Um, you know, the NDP, I think, was able to really flex their muscle um, in Calgary uh, last weekend. Um, this is a party that, you know, even when they were in government, had no ground game in, in Calgary, and they've spent the last four years working on building one. And so to be able to sort of go out and, you know, paint parts of the town orange was, was pretty remarkable. And I think they did that quite deliberately to demonstrate that they have tried to turn themselves into a party of, of Calgary. So I think that was a win on on their side and i think we've seen you know a, a mixed performance from the ucp um they haven't necessarily sort of burst out on the ground in the same way i think it 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 varies depends on where you varies depending on where you are but i i live in calgary varsity which is held by the health minister from the ucp um, he won by only three percentage points uh, in uh, 2019. So, you know, this is a riding that's likely to, to change hands. I have yet to see a UCP sign. And, and that's astonishing, right? And I've gone looking in the more conservative parts of uh, the, the riding. And so to have that kind of a slow start in, uh, you know, a, a bellwether riding, or I mean, a riding that you, you stand to lose, leaves me with questions. And we've seen a bit of kind of amateur hour, I think, from the UCP campaign on a few things. Yesterday, they issued a media release where they got the day wrong. Um, you know, they, it was Wednesday and they were announcing something on Wednesday that they meant Thursday, you know, so a lot, everyone made fun of them on Twitter. Not a huge deal, but it, it does sort of say, you know, okay, are they finding their feet? And there was a huge, br well, huge by Twitter standards, brouhaha, about um, a, a, a media uh, uh, release that they did having to do with costing of uh, net zero energy, where they had their own consultants basically saying, no, those are the wrong numbers publicly, so they had to back down, and then today they've decided that they haven't backed down. So. You know, those aren't exactly the things that you would expect to see from a slick, well-managed campaign. Now, maybe it's just growth pains, but, you know, we'll see, I guess. Yeah, as you mentioned, not really the kind of thing that moves votes, but could be an indication of something, uh, you know, maybe not clicking underneath. Maybe they just need to knock some rust off, but... Uh, you know, you don't want to be making mistakes in a campaign that's a, as close as this if it's a sign that later on there could be some mistakes. Uh, how about this? Uh, Lisa, I'll start with you and then Elise. Are voters caring about this? Are people engaged? Uh, is I mean, we're all engaged because we've been talking about it for months and how close it is. But the average Albertan, are they all that interested in this election? I, you know, I, I, I think... Many are, and I think you know the the enthusiasm that you see about people getting out signs and and those sorts of things. Um, th there's a lot of pent up feelings about politics in this province, so the people who've been paying attention, I think, certainly are engaged. My question is, what about that small group that keeps saying, "I don't know" on on opinion polls? Are they paying attention? And I just don't have a feel for that. Yeah, Elise, uh, has anyone been doing streeters, asking people their views? Yeah, we actually have. We have a great team of research students uh, who are helping us out here at CBC. So a couple of things. Alberta takes its grassroots politics really, really seriously It for both parties. Like the people who come out and work for the parties really, really feel strongly about uh, the necessity to be civically engaged. So 
Yes, voters are paying attention. Do I think that people are a little bit fatigued by all of the politics of the last few years? Probably. And that goes back to even leadership review in the UCP era, where it just and and COVID and all of those other things that had political ties to them that have left people feeling either a little bit bitter and jaded about the way that politics have played out in the province or a little bit hopeless uh, and not really liking either of their options. So people are paying attention from from the conversations that we're having. They do know the issues that they care about, so they're at least aware enough to understand the way that things in their world are being affected by what's going on politically, most of them. Um, but at the same time, I, I, the, the average voters and the people in Calgary especially, which is where I am, where people, uh, where, the, where both parties need to pick up this support, the people who make up that mushy middle and those like undecideds that Lisa was talking about, I haven't gotten the sense from any of them that we have heard from that they're particularly impressed or jazzed about either option, especially after this first week of the campaign. Yeah, there was in the abacus poll uh, put out just before the election had a huge proportion of NDP voters and UCP voters who were primarily voting uh, against the other party, which isn't off, uh, which is the case in every election. But to have such a big number uh, does suggest that this is not exactly an enthusiastic campaign, more of a I got to choose one of these two. Um, Canadian politics. So, we love voting people out. <laughs> yeah, that's it's, about, it's yeah. less of an in, more of an out. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll finish with this, uh, Lisa, then Elise. Uh, just what to watch on week two. I, I'm assuming one of the things is whether Daniel Smith can continue not talking about some of the things that she hasn't had. <laughs> She's been avoiding talking about this this week with uh, Arta Polosky and, and other stories like that happening. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly watch for whether the UCP adjusts its strategy and makes her a little bit more available or sticks with what they're they're doing. And then I guess the question is, you know, where is the NDP going to go with their strategy? It isn't clear to me yet. Um, you know, is it going to be the forward looking future campaign? Is it the negative campaign? Are they going to try to do both? Where are they going to land on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I'll be interested to see if both parties decide to take a different route besides waiting for the other one to blow itself up uh, in some kind of way. I will also be watching for uh, actual platforms because I'm nerdy and I want to read them, but also because it's important. Um, and the other particular date I'll be watching is May 11th, which is when nominations close, which means that you can't replace a candidate if you turf them. Um, and I have a sneaking suspicion both parties are holding back some oppo research until after that date to really start going after candidates uh, so that you're leaving your opponent with, with vacancies. Yeah, that's 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 dirty pool for sure. If you can make make that happen, uh, and also whether we'll see any other party nominate even a half slate. I think the last ones uh, counts I've seen from Dave Cornway of uh, Dave Berta has. I think the Greens have somewhere around thirty or forty candidates, but uh, no one seems to be getting close to eighty-seven aside from those two. So that'll be another thing to watch. Um, okay, so maybe the campaign will start getting a little bit more energetic as we get closer to election day. Uh, but I, I know that despite the fact that it hasn't been the most jam-packed few days of this campaign, you're both very busy. So I appreciate you joining me and uh, hopefully we'll chat again before election day. That sounds great. Thank you.